on. I didn't think I was going to get any more intimidated, but now that I'm sitting in this spot, it's a little nervous. Uh, just bear with me until I get my sea legs about me. Um, Dr. J challenged us um, to come up here and, and preach to you guys this summer, and uh, I'm happy to be in a church that gives us the opportunity and uh, a pastor that uh, just loves people. And um, Dr. J is more than just a pastor. He's, he's my professor. I studied under him at University of Mobile, and uh, he taught me homiletics. So if you have a problem with my preaching, take it up with Dr. J. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but it's really great that I have a lot of great men in this room who have really influenced me, um, Dr. J being one of them, and, and Dr. Olson sitting back there, and, and my dad, and uh, Nate Dodson, and, and a lot of men that have really uh, challenged me and, and helped me grow, answered a lot of my questions. So um, I, I consider it an honor just to preach to you guys and also to get to preach to men that have had such a great influence on my life. Um, but the title of my lesson tonight um, is uh, a Latin phrase, it's called Semper Reformanda, which means always reforming. Um, as uh, uh, Kenneth already spilled the beans, I was going to ask you guys if you knew what was coming up this October uh, 31st. It's the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. And, um, if you've spent five minutes with me talking about church history, you know I'm a total geek when it comes to uh, talking about the Reformation. It's one of my uh, favorite things to talk about and uh, uh, we're going to get a lot of my favorites tonight. We're preaching out of Romans. That's my favorite book of the Bible. So we're going to go through a lot, of, a lot of Joel's favorites tonight. But the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, it started October 31st, 1517, when a man named Martin Luther uh, took 95 theses and he nailed them to the church door in Wittenberg, Germany. Um, and that is what historians attribute the start of the Reformation um, there's a lot of men before him that prepared kind of the, uh, the harvest field like uh, Wycliffe and Huss. Uh, they, they did a lot of uh, preparation, but the man that historians attribute to the start of it would be Martin Luther. And I'm going to give you a little quick intro to kind of Martin Luther's life um, and, what, and what happened, what pushed him to that point to nail the 95 Theses to the church door. Um, Martin Luther was studying to be a lawyer, and I'm kind of giving you like the, the abridged version of this. It's going to take a lot of time, but... Um, he was traveling along on a road, gets caught in a lightning storm, scared to death. He says, help me, St. Anne, I'll become a monk. And he's a Catholic at the time. Um, and uh, he, he screams that out, and sure enough, he survives the lightning storm. Um, and so he goes and he joins a monastic order, an Augustinian, uh, August, Augustinian monks um, there shortly. Um, and he was very much into it. He was very much into doing the daily uh, monastic living. Uh, he's quoted as saying, if ever a monk gained heaven by its monkery, it was I. And so uh, it kind of reminds me of Paul saying, I was the Pharisee of Pharisees, Luther was the monk of monks. Um, uh, but there was a thing in his, in his daily living where he, he, he just didn't get justification. That was the thing that plagued him. He was a tortured soul. Um, he never, we talk about that peace that surpasses all understanding. Uh, Luther just didn't have it. He, he, couldn't, he couldn't get it. And he would do all this, this monkery, uh, but it, it gave him no peace. Um, he would do things like self-flagellation. He, he'd whip himself as penance for his sins. Um, he would uh, go to confession, and he'd spend all night uh, just confessing his sins to his confessor, a higher monk. And uh, the monk would get tired of it. He would say, Luther, go home. I, I'm tired of hearing this. Like, I want to go to bed. I don't want to sit here and listen to all your sins. And so he'd kick Luther out, and Luther would get to the door, and he'd stop, and he'd turn around, and he had another sin to confess, because he was so scared of the consequences of his sins. Um, so he was a tortured soul. So you know what they did? They said, okay, we have this really depressed, really tortured guy, so the best thing we can let him do is teach. So they uh, send him out to Wittenberg, to the university there, to teach, and uh, he gets to studying things like the Book of Romans, the Book of Galatians, um, and he begins uh, to teach the uh, students there at, at Wittenberg um, what, he, what he's kind of concluded in, in these books. Well, around that time, the Rome, the, the, the church, uh, at that time the Catholic Church, needed a lot of money. Um, and uh, they had people like Michelangelo painting the Sistine Chapel at the time. That takes money. And so they, they, they uh, needed to pay these people. So the Pope allows for the selling of an indulgence. 
Uh, and what indulgences are is a, is a Catholic belief that you can um, pay the church a sum of money, and then based on the stored merit of the saints and Jesus and Mary, uh, they would give you a, uh, your dead loved one a portion of it so that they could move from purgatory to heaven. And all of you guys are Baptists, so you're looking at me like, what coloring book did they get that out of? And, um, but you've got to remember, at the time, people didn't read the Bible. They, they didn't read it. They, it was the Vulgate, the Latin Vulgate. Nobody spoke Latin. Nobody read Latin. So they couldn't read their Bible. The Mass was conducted in Latin in the Catholic Church. So you really you just kind of sat there and, you know, you think I'm boring or Dr. J's boring. Try being in a sermon where you don't understand anything that's being said. And they would just have to sit there and, and listen to this guy speak Latin. And then whenever everybody got up to get the cracker and wine, they, they just stood up and followed in line. And uh, that's, that's how the Mass was done. Um, so when an indulgence came, the, the church is the one that told them everything what they needed to believe. So when they said an indulgence was good, it was kosher, they're like, all right, here's some money. Um, the guy around this time that uh, was selling these things, his name was Johann Tetzel. And he had a famous phrase as saying, as soon as a coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs, is what Johann Tetzel would say in his, his fiery sermons to get people to give money. Well, this infuriated Luther. He, he was the guy reading the, the, the Bible, and, and he was coming up with this, uh, these ideas, and he was just seeing the Catholic Church abuse their position, and he said, wait a minute, we can't do this, there needs to be change. So uh, they didn't have Facebook or Instagram back then, but they had a church door, that was kind of their social hub, and so he writes 95 things that he doesn't like about uh, the selling of indulgences mostly, but other things about the Catholic Church as well, and on October 31st, all, um, uh, Hallow's Eve, the, the, the evening before All Saints Day, he knew people were going to be coming in the next morning. He nails it to the church door of, um, of Wittenberg, and uh, he starts a cataclysmic event that will forever change human history, uh, just with that swing of the hammer. Um, and he was put on trial, and uh, he, he went to a place called, uh, it, it was called a diet at the time, but that's just the trial, and a place called Worms. And um, he was put on trial in front of the Holy Roman Empire, and uh, they asked him to recant. And Luther, and it's kind of been dramatized, but uh, we don't know if he really said all of this, but we, there might be some dramatization, but the famous phrase is, my conscience is captive to the word of God. Or, I'm sorry, captive to the word. I can't read my own handwriting. My conscience is captive to the word of God. To go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand. I can do no other. So help me God. Amen. What Luther did was he said, under fear of death, scripture, it has to be scripture. No matter if I like it, no matter if it's safe, no matter if it's comfortable, it has to be scripture. And he came up with a phrase, or he didn't come up with it, but a phrase, this idea of this theology that was culminated. Uh, we have the five pillars of the Reformation, uh, and one of the pillars was sola scriptura, or scripture alone which means that this scripture is the ultimate authority in faith and practice of the church. That idea comes from the Reformation. Um, and it is the foundation for the Reformation. You can't get the other four pillars, uh, the, the faith alone, the grace alone, Christ alone, the glory of God alone. You can't get the rest of them until you have scripture first. Um, and so 500 years after Luther started the Reformation, we have to continue in his approach. You see, that's the idea of Semper Reformanda. We're always reforming. The church must continue in reformation. And according to Romans 12, we do this by choosing to renew our minds, repel cultural influences, and refuse selfish and fleshly desires. I'm going to pray for us real quick, and then we'll jump into Romans 12. Lord, I thank you so much for this opportunity. I thank you so much for my church family. I thank you for the... Uh, the men in this room and, and the women in this room that have influenced me. Uh, Lord, I just ask you to be with this time. Speak through me. Help me to decrease so that you may increase. For it's in Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. All right, so we're going to read Romans 12. Again, my favorite book of the Bible. Um, Romans 12 is actually part of our, uh, our college group, right? That's their, their verse, right? Uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2 is their, uh, their, I guess, power verse. I don't know what you would call it. Yeah, Brian's giving me a thumbs down on saying a power verse, but um, it, it, it's their verse. Um, and so we're going to read that, uh, and it, it goes like this. Paul writes, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, 
holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. Amen. Um, Romans 12 became one of my, my favorite chapters in, in the book of Romans. Uh, in one of my college, uh, well, not my college class, but at, at the uh, church I was going to previously, we had a college and career group, and um, a man there challenged me, uh, or challenged the class, to memorize Romans 12. He thought it was so essential to, um, uh, to a Christian life that he challenged us to memorize it. And he said if you, if you did, he'd buy you a Bible or a book of your choosing. Well, at the time, I knew I was changing my major to theology, and I wanted an ESV study Bible. So um, I went and memorized it, like, just for two weeks, poured over it that summer. And, uh, and uh, it was Nate Dodson. He was, he was our teacher at the time. And uh, he bought me an ESV study Bible. And I remember reading that, and it just being, you know, the glass-breaking moment that when you, you just see how we're supposed to live and, and, and what the reason behind it is and, and the power behind it. Um, it, it's a great chapter, and I would urge you guys to read the rest of it. Um, uh, we're not going to jump into all of it uh, tonight, but uh, we're going to stay in, in the verses 1 and 2. So what I've uh, come up with here, um, I tried to do a Dr. J and, and kind of, uh, I think it's called alliterate my, uh, my, uh, my uh, sermon here. So it's the three R's to biblical reformation, the, 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 the letter R, the three R's to biblical reformation. And I kind of already said them, um, but the first one is going to be renew your mind in Scripture. And we're going to kind of work backwards on this verse that we're doing. Romans 12, 2 is where we're going to start. It's going to be the second half of that verse. Uh, and it says, um, but be transformed by the renewal of your minds, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. Um, so Paul writes that renewing your mind reveals the will of God. Now this is not... Uh, or this is the revealed will of God, not his sovereign will, right? You're not going to read Romans 77 times and automatically know the lottery numbers tomorrow or anything like that. So it's not, it's not the future sovereign will, right? But it is the revealed will of God. And uh, this, um, this is things like how we should live, right? That's his will. He has, he, has, he has designed in his word how Christians should live. And it's in the second uh, part of this chapter we, we will see a lot about um, how Christians are, are supposed to live, what we're supposed to be like, what's our culture supposed to be like. If you haven't caught on to the past few um, uh, sermons that have been done in the summer series and, and Ryan's excellent sermon and last week and uh, the other men that have come up here, there's an idea of being transcultural. Like that's, that's a common theme that we're getting here. And what transcultural means is that we need to be able to be in American culture and then stay under those same ideas and be able to step into another culture and not miss a beat. That's transcultural. The things that get hooked up, like if we can't make that smooth transition, if there are things that are weighing us down, then there are weights that need to be cast aside. Right? We, we, we need to be transcultural, and we also need to be transgenerational. Right? There, there shouldn't be um, a, a certain time of, in, in history that we, we latch on to. We have to continue reforming um, and there shouldn't be a, a certain place in the world that we have to latch on to. We have to be transcultural. Um, but God reveals to us this will, right, through perpetual study um, of how he would have his people act, talk, think, etc. And it is always good, acceptable, and perfect. Both Paul and Luther realized that to see true revival, or if you want to call it reformation, one must seek to conform his or herself to God's word. <coughs> right, if we want revival in this church, or call it reformation, we have to seek to conform ourselves to what God has said the church should be in scripture. Um, my dad is here tonight, and he's a chemist at Evonik, and uh, he works in the MMAT department, and he, run, he does quality control. Um, what quality control is when their MMAT department produces a chemical, they give it to my dad in his lab to test it and make sure it meets all the specs that their customer wants, and then they go and, and they, they sell it to the customer. Um, to do that, um, he runs a, a machine, um, and this machine has a controlled substance in it that he runs first. So if they were testing something like pH, that's something we all know. I'm not a chemist. Like, my mom's not a chemist, my brother's not a chemist. 
I'm not a chemist. My dad just has no one to talk to uh, about this stuff. Um, but pH, I think we all can get behind. We know what that means. Um, and so if they, they would run a controlled substance that they knew should maybe hit seven, like that's, that's right in the middle. And so they run it through the machine first to make sure the machine's calibrated right so that when they run the sample, they're getting a good reading. They're getting a true reading uh, on, on the, the product. The scripture is our controlled substance, and it's always perfect, right? It's always perfect. We're going to get what we need to get every time out of scripture. So we use that as the example for how we have to emulate our minds. We have to agree on this. Otherwise, I'm wasting my breath up here. And Dr. J is wasting his breath every Sunday if we don't believe that Scripture is our ultimate authority. If we don't agree to that, we might as well not be here. Right? That's, uh, that's something that's actually very pivotal to Protestant denominations. We have to believe that. Um, my second point here, and I'm going to move on, is we have to repel cultural influences. That's Romans 12.2a. All right, that's the first part of Romans 12.2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. So once we have agreed and we've studied and we perpetual study of God's word and we got what we need to be, we then can use that information to do these other two things, repel uh, culture and refuse selfish fleshly desires. We can do that after we have scripture. Paul writes that Christians are to fight conformity to the status quo of culture. That's what he's telling them. If you remember the, the time period that Paul lived in, he lived in a very Hellenistic age where there was some serious wickedness going on. Um, you know, he wrote letters to a church, a church where there is a, um, a stepson having an affair with his stepmom. Right? That's, that's so it's, it's, it's not unlike today where we're seeing such scandalous things, uh, even in the church. So he wrote, he was in a wicked time as well, and he had to be transcultural to tell them, hey, don't be like the Gentiles and the wicked things that they do, the perverted things they do. But he's also fighting another front. Remember, he has the Judaizers that he's fighting. Right? They're the ones telling um, the Gentiles that they're converting, hey, you need to get circumcised, you need to follow the law, you need to do all these things. Um, otherwise, you're not a Christian. And so Paul had to fight that front as well. These people that were attached to traditions, he had to fight that. And then these people that were very liberal and very um, uh, into the, the, the Roman culture, he's fighting a, a two-front war here. We, how we um, fight cultural influences, we do this by comparing traditions to the Word of God to see if they are God-glorifying. If not, we put them to death. Amen? Amen. We have to put them to death. If, 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 they go find, if we compare them to Scripture and we find them wanting, then we have the responsibility as the church to kill it. That's what we have to do. I always like the analogy when we call the Bible a double-edged sword because um, the sword is, is, is good for cutting in this direction and, and back in this direction as well to, for ourselves. We, don't, we're, we like to use it over here, but we don't like to bring it back and, and use it on ourselves. And we all have them. We all have traditions. We all have things and sins that we struggle with. We all have preferences that we elevate to the status of law. We have to kill it. And we do it in love. And we exhort each other to put them to death. That's what we have to do. That is biblical. And I know a lot of times it sounds like we're, we're harping on uh, one generation uh, to, to change and to change, but that's not, that's not the case. You see, we also have to worry about not just the things that we have, we've done in the past that uh, are, are weighing us down, but we have to do the things that might come in the future as well. We've got we to gotta push back on culture there. Um, a lot of times we see things in church where they see this cool new way to do things. To, to attract people, um, to you see these Fortune 500 companies do something some way, so they apply it to their church, and they expect success that way. We use worldly, secular knowledge to do church, and it, we find out years later that, hey, maybe that was a bad idea. Well, we shouldn't have done that. Um, so then we have to be weary of, of, of new things as well. See, it's, it's not about an older generation or a younger generation. It's about whether it's truth or not. It's not about 
saying change all these things that we've done for 50 years and do all these new things or stay the, way, stay the course and, and, and throw off all these new things. It's middle ground. It's both and. We have to do scripture. That is what we're commanded to do. I have a good analogy um, about one thing, and it makes me laugh um, because it's kind of embarrassing. If you don't know me, I, I've said it already, I'm a giant geek when it comes to things. Like, uh, I love all kinds of sci-fi and, and stuff like that, so uh, I'm kind of a nerd. was a nerd as a kid. Um, and uh, I remember I was about maybe fifth grade. I was, I was late grade or late elementary school, early. I don't think I was quite in middle school yet, but... I remember uh, one Christmas, my mom came to me. She called me pumpkin pie back then. <laughs> she said, uh, "She said pumpkin pie. Um, Christmas is coming up. Uh, I'm thinking maybe you need a new bedspread." I'm like, "Yeah, yeah. Mine's mine's, get, mine's getting old, mom. That's a good idea. I need a new bedspread." She goes, "Well, do you have any idea of what you want your bedspread to be?" And I said, "No, no. I'll think about it." Well, back then, I don't know if they still do it, they shipped Toys R Us magazines. I don't know, I guess they had like a census to know every house that had young kids. They would ship us seven because we would sit there and badger dad until Christmas comes to buy us a cool new toy. But in that Toys R Us magazine, there was a bedspread. And it was a Pokemon bedspread. <laughs> and I don't know if you know what Pokemon was or is. You might say, what is he saying? Uh, it was a little Japanese cartoon that... Uh, started as a, a video game and then it became a trading card game and became a, a TV series. They had all these clothes. I did it all. You can ask me. You can validate. I loved it. I'd, I'd go early to school and I'd bring my Game Boy Color in my backpack and before school would start, uh, we would all pull out our Game Boy Colors in the bathroom and we'd battle our, our Pokemon and we would trade, trade things and stuff like that. And it, yeah, I told you. We're, we're going to get real here for a second. Um... And I saw in that magazine, it was like, oh, I, I saw the Pokemon bed spread. And I said, Mom. And she said, yeah, pumpkin pie. And uh, she said, I go, you remember that bed spread thing you were talking about? And she goes, yeah, did you find one? And I said, look at this. And she had no expression. No expression on her face. And I said, you know, I'm looking at her like, yeah, yeah, we're going to make it happen. Um, and Mom goes, Maybe, uh, maybe, maybe we don't do that one. <laughs> I go, why not? We, we, you know, I, I do Pokemon everything. And she kind of had some wisdom for me. She said, listen, it's cool now. Poke Pokemon's cool now for you. You love it. I get it. Yeah. Have fun with it. But I'm not buying you a bedspread in the next five years. This is going to be the one that you're keeping. When, so that means you're going to be in high school with a Pokemon bedspread. <laughs> And I was like, I don't understand the problem. Of it. And she goes, well, you're going to have people over. They're going to come into your room, and they're going to see a Pokemon bedspread. And you might not like that. You might be a little embarrassed. And I said, Pokemon? I love Pokemon. And she didn't let me get it. She didn't let me get the bedspread. Her wisdom won out. And at that point, I didn't understand it. I thought my mom was just being a tyrant. Um, but standing here today, as much as I still wish I had that Pokemon bedspread, well, my wife won't let me have it. Um, I understand why. I, I really understand why she did it. And that's kind of my analogy to these future culture uh, changing things that we, we glean from secular culture is they look cool now. Right? They're awesome now. What about in 20 years? Right? We, we have a service to the church to protect it. Right? We, have, we have a service to the church to be disciplined and to compare anything to Scripture first. And then we trust our elders. <clears throat> scripture first, and then we trust our elders. Elders meaning pastors. Um, what we see today a lot in culture, and we just had an election, so we, law, we saw a lot of it, the polarization of people, right, with no, no willingness to dialogue. I'm not saying you have to have one way or the other. I'm not getting on a, a political soapbox up here. But we as Christians should always want to give our opponent dialogue. We want to hear them. We want to hear what they say. And sometimes, even in this church, we might have opponents. We might see things differently. And we have to love each other enough, love Christ enough, 
to say that this is the bride of Christ, so we have to respect it, and we have to say, this is where I stand, where's my scriptural support for it? And then, take it to the brother I disagree with and say, here's my scriptural support, and lovingly, dialogue. I, I will tell you, I bet 100%, Dr. J wouldn't mind that one bit if you came to the elder and you said, listen, here's my, here's my beef, Here's my scriptural support as to why. But you know what we do? We talk about it in private to our close friends and our, our groups. And we don't, and that, that weakens the church. Amen. It causes divide in the church. Right. We're now beating the bride of Christ because of our own agendas, our own selfish wants. And we'll, we'll, we'll get to that one. Um, Man, I'm still hung up on the Pokemon bed spread. Hold on, forgive me. <laughs> I gotta get to point three. How am I doing on time? All right, we got we got a few more minutes. So, point three is refuse selfish and fleshly desires. All right, that's Romans 12:1. I'll read that one more time for us. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Now, I know Dr. Yance taught me biblical interpretation, and he's going to kill me. I know what he's already like thinking that, Joel, you didn't explain what the therefore is there for. That's what he'd always tell me. He would always mark off on my papers and stuff like that. If you had a, a phrase that you were interpreting or uh, doing biblical interpretation, if you were exegeting, um, if you didn't explain what the therefore in the passage meant, you, uh, you're not doing it right. But for sake of time, I don't have the time to tell you what the therefore is there for. So I'm going to ex assume you know what the therefore he is referring to. Um, so we're going we're to skip that part. Um, but I want to get to the point where it says, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Paul writes that Christians, we spiritually worship God when we are when we are a living sacrifice. Now, living sacrifice is one of those words where you're like, what? what? How can you both die and live at, at the same time? Um, and, and to a non-Christian, it would be very puzzling. It's one of those phrases that we just say in the church and we assume everyone knows what we're talking about. But to a new convert, you know, if they ask us, what is a living sacrifice? It is talking about that we are living, right? We're, we're breathing, but we are a sacrifice in the fact that <laughs> We live not for ourselves. We have sacrificed that because we believe in glorifying God, spiritually worshiping Jesus Christ for what he did for us on Calvary. That's a, that's a sacrifice, right? Um, so we do things differently. And when we're talking about counterculturally, we should be the odd people. I like weird people. I really do. I, I like weird people. They're interesting. They have something to say. They always have a story. And, and weirdly, they always have a piece of candy, too. I don't know what it is about weird people, but they always have something to give you. Um, um, but weird people are good, and Christians should be weird. Right? It's okay to be weird. We need to be weird. Weird is good. Right? We have to be different than the culture. And a lot of times when we read this, be different than the culture, we think of like the, the, the East Coast and the West Coast, their culture. Right? We, we think of, you know, we're, we're not, you know, uh, no one's gender here is fluid. Right? We have no gender fluid people in here, I, I, I would assume. Um, typically, we don't have that in, in the South. We don't, um, we, we don't have as much of the liberal agenda in our face here. So we have to apply this to ourselves. We have to be weird when in the Southern culture. That's what we need to be weird about. We shouldn't just do things because that's the tradition or that's the way it's been. We should do things according to scripture. And if we do that, we will be weird. You see, what we have a problem with in the South is we have cultural Christians. They're just a product of mommy and daddy having some loose, loosely fit Christian morals and maybe attend church, you know, once or twice a month. But no real structure as to what a Christian should be. No real development of theology in your children. We just have cultural Christians. And a, a better word is nominal Christians. Meaning in name only are they Christian. They call themselves Christian. But there's no fruit as, as Dr. J talked to us about uh, this morning. There's no fruit. 
If we lived and we refused selfish fleshly desires and we, we lived intentionally, right? We have to live intentionally. We're going to talk about the rest of Romans 12 here. Some of the things we got to live intentionally. We're going to be weird and we're going to be different. And that's awesome. That's great. You see, a living sacrifice, it despises the American dream. It, they want to spit it out of their mouth. A living sacrifice has no time for the American dream because we're about our father's business. We don't have time to get earthly baubles and treasures to store up for a future that we know it all perishes. Right? There's a lot of people, and, and that's, that's their drive, to get up, work, make money, spend it. That's their life. And we hate that. Right? That makes us weird in, in this culture. A living sacrifice lives in a way contrary to its feelings or wants. How hard is that? Like, if you're, you're faced with something, and you, have, you always have this innate, like, animalistic response to something. You know, when a guy cuts you off in traffic, you don't say, hey, bless you. <laughs> you might say it sarcastically. The innate fleshly desire wants to say something I can't say in this pulpit. Dr. J said I couldn't say that word. And, and, and that's what the innate fleshly desire wants. We have to deny that, and we have to do the thing that's uh, finishing in Romans 12 that says... Bless those that persecute you. Or let me let me get the, 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 the actual what it says here. Um, it says, Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Bless those that persecute you, bless and do not curse them. I love the song, um, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Um, Kenneth sang it for me. That song was the battle song of the Reformation. You see the rest of the story as Martin Luther helped start the Reformation. He dies, and then they fight like a 30-year war over the Reformation. Men, women, everybody dying for things like sola scriptura. That we, we just, we do, we have the ability to read a Bible in our own language. Men died for that. And um, that song was the song that they would march into battle with. Singing, a mighty fortress is our God. And um, I was writing it this morning, we were kind of singing it on the way to church, and it kind of made me tear up to think about we have it so good in America. We have it so good that we don't have to face persecution on a daily basis. And you know what we did with it? Not much. You see, too much is given, much is required. So if we think about the way America is, we have it better than any, any people group ever in the history of the world. We have it better. We're, we are, as a, as a, as a uh, civilization, richer than any other people group in the history of the world. We, we are. But yet, we still complain about money. Right? We, money is still a problem to us, but we got to think about the people that, you know, lived around Martin Luther's time that, you know, a common cold would, would kill them, right? That, that, those are the things that they're facing. They're facing armies sent by the Holy Roman Empire to knock down your door and kill you because you say, I want church done in my language so I can understand whatever's going on in there. They want to kill you for that. And yet, we don't have any of that. But yet, as, as uh, my father-in-law was talking about, some of us, and him at one time, didn't care about the Bible. Didn't care about the Word of God until the Holy Spirit got a hold of him. Some of the other things that are in Romans 12, I remember memorizing this, sitting, sitting down and, and trying to memorize it, and I got stuck on verse 9. Let love be genuine. Man, that's that hard. And I'm honest with you guys. Loving people, genuinely loving people, is so hard. All right? And it's, and it's not because of any, uh, like, barrier in the way to just love people. It's because our flesh hates it so much. And our, our ancient foe that we sung about, and, and uh, a mighty fortress is our God. He is oppressing you in, in those ways. Um, let love be genuine. You think about that. Now, I could, be, I could genuinely love, maybe love my kids, my wife maybe on a good day, 
Um, my parents, my, 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 my brothers, their you know, family, in-laws. I, I can love them genuinely. But this is not who he's talking about. You know, the infidel can love his family genuinely. We're supposed to love those that hate us. Genuinely love them. Not because we will get some jewel in our crown maybe in heaven someday. It's not why we love them. We love them because while we were yet sinners, Christ loved us. Christ died for us, right? Um, that's why we love them. The love in us. And there's another part in there. It says, repay no man evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Those that are hurting us, we naturally want vengeance, right? And he says, um, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Powerful verse. Goosebumps are not standing up on your arms right now. There's something wrong. Right? We talk about revival, and I'm calling it reformation, but Dr. J has a great line. He says, you've got to first be vibed before you can be revived. Right? So you, we need to be alive in Christ, and when we hear those things, it's a challenge. It, it is a challenge. The flesh doesn't want it. When someone comes to you, and you have a disagreement, or, or, or it exhorts you in love to, to kill a tradition in your life, the natural man recoils and says, how dare you? How dare you judge me? But we have to fight it. We have to fight that natural man. We kill that man. There's no good there. There's nothing prosperous in the old man. It's in the new man that we put on. And the new man repays no man evil for evil. He loves genuinely. He abhors evil. He holds fast to what is good. That is the new man. And that's what we have to be. So when we find ourselves in a predicament where we're arguing... We have to love, genuinely love, and seek reformation. It's almost impossible. If it was up to us, it would be impossible. If it was our own abilities to get us through such a conundrum, we would fail a hundred times out of a hundred. But Philippians 4.13, a great verse, a very popular verse, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Growing up, and uh, as a kid, I played Little League. I wasn't too good at it, but I, I played, and my brother played. And kids would always have it on the back of their helmets, and I always laughed at them. Because they, they were applying that verse to hitting a baseball. That's not what Paul had in mind when he, he's in jail at the time, writing Philippians 4.13. He was like, yeah, maybe some kid, some kid will get a hit on a curveball as I write this. Um, that's not what he had in mind. He's talking about oppression. He's talking about the difficult things that we have to do as the new man when the world... Satan, our own flesh, are against us. That's the opposition. He had that in mind. And he says, depend on Christ. We sing it in A Mighty Fortress is Our God. I, I love it. Um, he says, uh, God, man, I just lost the, the lyric there. Um, a, a man of God's own choosing, right? We, 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 if we put it on our, if we put, rely on ourselves, well, there's no hope for us. But we rely on someone else, a man of God's own choosing. You ask who that may be? Christ Jesus. It is He. He is the one that did everything necessary for us to love genuinely on Calvary. He died so that you could be regenerated. At that moment, you have given the Holy Spirit to be in there. And if you read Romans 8, He's always on your, on your part, even when you don't think about it consciously. There with the Father on your behalf. You have that. You have Jesus. And you have the sovereign God of the universe on your side saying, yeah, you can do it. You can love genuinely. That's why a mighty fortress is our God. That's why I love that song. Because when we go to battle, when we go to battle every day, we have the Trinity on our side. And the enemy hates it. And he knows it. And he has nothing left. He has no, no other play in the playbook except keep you from thinking about it. That's the enemy's job. True biblical reformation comes from first renewing our minds in God's word and then repelling those cultural influences. I should put cautiously repelling cultural influences, but see, 
ruined my R thing. But cautiously repelling cultural influence and then refusing selfish fleshly desires. One of my favorite things about Luther was his humility. He had rock star status in 16th century Germany. Right? He was a famous guy. Everyone knew Luther. You, always, you had an opinion about Luther, good or bad. Um, but yet, when asked how he, he accomplished such a, bar a paradigm shift like the Protestant Reformation in, in, in that European culture, he replied, I did nothing. I simply wrote, taught, preached, and while I slept and drank Wittenberg beer with Philip and Amsdorf, God dealt the papacy a mighty blow. He attributed it all to God. God did it. He was sovereign. He was the one doing the Reformation. That's his job. I just do it. And see, Luther realized the secret to revival and reformation. It is simply starts with an individual seeking to conform his life to God's desires and then encouraging others to do so. Let's pray.